The last set of, set of slides is going to look at the types of intermicrobial gene transfer. And these are questions 19 and 20 on your assessment and the last two of the questions. There are three types of intermicrobial exchange, and this is when microorganisms, bacteria specifically, exchange genetic information. There may be a virus involved, and that is in the process called transduction. Now, conjugation we already learned about in Module 2, and this is where two like bacteria are going to conjugate with the help of a pilus. A pilus is an extension made out of the protein pilin. In this case, both the donor and the recipient uh, will be alive, and the plasmid is called an F plasmid or a fertility plasmid. A bridge forms between the two cells, so the donor and the recipient, in order to transfer DNA. This is a direct means of exchange, and some examples of some genes that can be transferred are genes that encode drug resistance. For example, uh, antimicrobial pumps that would be able to pump a, uh, an antibiotic such as tetracycline out of the cell, or it could be a gene for coding for beta-lactamase. Uh, beta-lactamase beta is an enzyme that we'll learn about in Module 4. We also can see genes that confer resistance to metals, such as mercury or silver. Uh, mercury and silver have long been used as antimicrobial agents. Uh, production of toxin can be under the control of an F, pla an F plasmid. Enzymes, adherence molecules, degradation of uh, toxic substances also, and the uptake of iron are all examples of genes that can be transferred between bacteria. The process of transformation is what we'll be looking at in lab. In this case, there is no pillus involved. Instead, free DNA, and it's either a fragment, a little piece of DNA, or a plasmid itself. Plasmids are quite small that actually can be taken up by a live, competent recipient cell. So uh, cells can be naturally competent or they can be induced into competency. In lab, we will be inducing competency by incubating the E. coli with cold calcium chloride. This is an indirect means because there's no contact between two bacteria in order for this to happen. Uh, the, the donor may actually, actually be dead, uh, but the living uh, recipient has to accept the donor DNA. Uh, this was first seen with polysaccharides capsules, as uh, was discovered by Griffiths. We'll take a look at that in this slides. It is unlimited with cloning techniques, and it is uh, quite important in microbial genetics, and uh, you don't believe you'll be looking at transformation in the Howard Hughes Medical in Institute activity that you'll be doing, but transformation very readily is used in genetic engineering techniques, and uh, metabolic enzymes can also be introduced into a cell via transformation. The third type involves a bacterial virus, and the donor is going to be a bacterial cell whose DNA becomes incorporated into the virus. The virus is called a bacteriophage, and it carries the donor DNA. And it is uh, important that the recipient cell is the same species as the donor. Uh, this is, of course, natural because the viruses are specific for the bacteria that they can infect. So a colophage, for example, will only infect E. coli. It won't go on and infect a staphylococcus or a pseudomonas. Uh, the types of genes that can be transferred here are exotoxins, also uh, enzymes for sugar fermentation, and also enzymes for drug resistance. So conjugation happens primarily in gram-negative bacteria. We don't see this happening in gram-positive bacteria. Gram-positive bacteria can exchange genetic information, but it's going to be uh, through transformation, not conjugation. So conjugation requires a physical contact between two, uh, two organisms. The organism you see on the top is a rod-shaped bacterium, and it houses an F-factor plasmid. Can, this uh, cell, because it houses this plasmid, this circular piece of DNA, and you can see it here as this circular piece of DNA here that is extra chromosomal, meaning that it is not part of the chromosome, this cell is called an F+. Plus. It's an F+, plus because it is capable of conjugating with an F- minus cell. 
So the F minus cell right here does not have the plasmid or it doesn't have this particular plasmid, doesn't mean it doesn't have any plasmids, but it doesn't have this particular plasmid. And because of genes that are present on the F factor itself, lapillus can be formed and DNA then can be transferred from the F plus into the F minus. So we only see this happening with like organisms, E. coli and other E. coli, or E. coli and Klebsiella, for example, uh, E. coli and Proteus. These are closely related microorganisms. So the pillus actually is like a fishing line, and the fishing line is going to draw these two organisms close together, and um, these two cells are going to be involved in conjugation then. Taking a look at the F factor, which is a, a small plasmid, it is circular, it has a couple of important genes. Uh, the first is the ORET gene. This is the origin of transfer gene that is necessary for transferring the pillus from the F plus cell into the F minus cell. The TRAA, or the TRAA gene, is going to be uh, necessary for the production of pillin, so it codes for the protein pillin. Pillin makes the pillus, which is necessary for the, the contact between the, uh, the two organisms. Then there are the TRA-K, the TRA-B, and the TRA-P genes. These are genes that code for proteins in the exporter that we'll see momentarily. TRA-D codes for the coupling protein, and then TRA-I codes for the relaxase gene. So let's see what these genes are going to be involved in. In F factor transfer, only plasmid genes are going to be transferred. The recipient becomes F plus and can participate in subsequent conjugations. So here we have an F plus cell. A bridge is going to be made with the pillus. The DNA is going to be transferred single-strandedly from the F, pl F plasmid into the F factor and into the recipient cell. And now this recipient cell has an exact copy of the F factor, and it, it is now F plus, and can go on and conjugate with other F minus cells. Okay. So these are the details, and after I show, read the details to you, I'll show you the video. First, there has to be a physical contact made between the F plus and the F minus cell via the pillus. Again, the pillus is synthesized under the direction of the F plasmid. The two bacteria draw close together to form the conjugation bridge, and genes within the F, pla F factor plasmid encode a protein complex called the relaxosome. So the relaxosome recognizes a sequence in the plasmid known as the origin of transfer. The relaxosome makes a cut in one strand of the DNA and also catalyzes its separation from the other strand. So the Two DNA strands separate from one another and they unwind. Relaxase, a protein from the complex, the relaxosome complex, remains attached to the single-stranded uh, DNA. Relaxase re recognizes a coupling factor that helps the DNA into the exporter. And the exporter is a protein complex that spans both the inner and outer membranes of the donor cell. And the genes for the exporter complex are found on the plasmid. So the plasmid is going to control the synthesis of the exporter complex. The exporter is now going to pump that single-stranded DNA into the recipient cell. That's an F minus cell. And in the recipient cell, relaxase is going to join the two ends of the DNA to make it a circular molecule. Remember, it is an F plasmid, so it remains extra chromosomal. And the DNA now single-stranded in the recipient cell is going to be replicated by the recipient enzymes. So the enzymes that are already present in the F minus cell makes that single-stranded circular DNA plasmid into a double-stranded DNA. And now the recipient cell is called an F plus cell. Bacterial conjugation is a process of genetic transfer between bacterial cells that requires direct contact between the cells. Many, but not all, species of bacteria can conjugate. 
Conjugation can occur between cells of the same species or even between cells of two different species. A small DNA circle or plasmid called the F factor is required for conjugation. The F factor stands for fertility factor. Strains of bacteria containing the F factor are called F plus. Those without it are called F minus. An F plus cell or donor produces a structure called a pilot to connect with another recipient cell. To begin conjugation, the F factor is caught at a specific region called the origin of transfer by a protein assembly called the relaxosome, which associates with the strand to be transferred, or the tDNA strand. Accessory proteins of the relaxosome are released, but a portion of the relaxosome called the relaxase remains attached to the tDNA. This tDNA relaxase complex is recognized by a coupling factor and transferred to the exporter, a complex in the F plus cell that is contiguous with the pilus. The exporter pumps the tDNA relaxase complex into the recipient cell. Once the entire tDNA molecule is transferred to the recipient cell, relaxase joins the ends to make a circular DNA molecule. As the tDNA is transferred to the recipient cell, it is replicated to become double-stranded. In the donor cell, the F-factor DNA was also replicated to become double-stranded. This actually occurred as the tDNA was being transferred to the recipient cell. In the end, both cells wind up with a complete double-stranded copy of the F-factor. Their connection to the pilus is released, and each is now an F-plus cell that can go on to conjugate with other cells. The other type of uh, transfer is called an HFR cell formation. An HFR stands for high frequency of recombination. An HFR cell is created when the F factor, instead of remaining extra chromosomal, in integrates into the bacterial chromosome. So here you can see on the left the F plus cell. And what you are seeing here are the PRA1 and, and I'm sorry, the Pratt plus and LAC plus. These are different um, genes that would be found. So these two genes are found actually on the chromosome of this bacterium. And here you see, uh, I think this LAC plus is supposed to be on the um, F plasmid. So here's the plasmid. The plasmid is an extra chromosomal. And when it integrates into the host cell chromosome, as you can see here, we call this an HFR cell. So HFR bacteria are capable of conjugating with F minus bacteria. In this conjugative event, uh, the F plasmid becomes incorporated into the bacterial chromosome and it is now called the HFR donor. During conjugation, this cell can transfer many genes from the chromosome and sometimes it actually transfers the entire chromosome, although this is extremely rare. Usually, only part of the F plasmid itself is transferred, so the recipient remains F minus. So let's take a look at the details here and then we'll come back and look at the video. Okay. So the entire F factor gets integrated into the host cell chromosome and we call this an episome. So the same proteins involved in F factor transfer can still be synthesized. Everything you, you saw in the previous slide um, that can, could be synthesized in F factor transfer could still be synthesized here. So genes from the HFR cells chromosome are transferred to the F minus recipient. Now, in this case, usually the origin of transfer genes are not transferred. So the recipient does not become F plus, instead remains F minus. The longer the length that these cells can mate, the more chromosomal genes, genes can be transferred, but it takes about two hours for the entire chromosome to be transferred to the F minus cell. Uh, and if the entire chromosome gets transferred, then the cell does become F plus. However, this event is very, very rare because of two bacterial, two bacterial cells conjugating for two hours is very, very rare. Once inside the cell, then the chromosomal material from the HFR can swap, it can called recombine, with the homologous, homologous reason, 
geez, the homologous region of the recipient's chromosome. So if there was a, a similar gene, for example, it can swap out for that gene that was in there. So this may provide the recipients with new genes. The recipient remains F minus, and the HFR cell remains an HFR cell. A variation of the F plasmid occurs when the F plasmid inserts itself into the host chromosome. As it replicates and transfers itself, it does so beginning in the middle of the plasmid, and thus it begins to drag the entire host chromosome along with it, and the entire plasmid is not transferred to the second cell until the entire host chromosome comes as well. This, this process, process to transfer, transfer the entire host chromosome, chromosome takes, takes between, between one and a half and two hours. Because these host traits, traits are frequently transferred with it, these plasmids are known as HFR plasmids, or high frequency of recombination. Variations of this process can be performed which have had great success in mapping bacterial chromosomes. So, for example, if this conjugation is allowed to proceed, but it is interrupted at different intervals, say, you know, after 10 minutes or so, then only the genes which are closest to the site where the F plasmid insert itself uh, to this origin of plasmid insertion would be transferred in that time interval. And so, when one examines what new traits have been transferred to the second cell, only those genes which are closest to the site would be transferred, say, within 10 minutes. Then, this interrupted mating experiment could proceed allowing, say, 20 minutes to uh, pass before these cells are separated. And this could be done, you know, in originally uh, simply with a blender where the cells are allowed to form the sex pillars, which then brings the two cells closer together. But then as the medium is agitated, then the cells are torn apart. Thus, uh, the length of conjugation can be controlled. If the cells are allowed to perform conjugation for 20 minutes, the not only would the first uh, genes, which are closest to the origin, be transferred, but then also then genes which are a little farther away. If uh, the conjugation is allowed to go on for 30 minutes, then a few more genes, more distant to the origin, might be transferred. If the conjugation is allowed to go on uh, for 40 minutes before it is interrupted, then a few more genes still. Now, once, once again, again, it may take one and a half to two hours for the entire host chromosome uh, to be transferred, and so various interrupted mating experiments uh, can be performed, uh, which will allow one to map the genes on the entire host chromosome. In order to do this, it is important that the HFR strain have the plus form of many genes. So the plus forms, say, of, the galact of a galactose gene or the plus form of a histidine gene where uh, the original cell can make these required metabolites. And then the second cell would be unable to make these metabolites. So it would be his minus or gal minus, etc. And so therefore, the minus strain would only be able to grow in media where these nutrients are provided. That way, if conjugation has, uh, uh, has passed, then these second cells would then have the ability uh, to grow in a media which lacks uh, these important metabolites because now they have acquired the gene which allows them to make their own. So, so this, this type, type of modified, modified F plasmid, plasmid which, which has inserted itself into the host chromosome, has, has been a very valuable tool in mapping the bacterial, bacterial chromosome, chromosome and, and is known as an HFR plasmid. plasmid.
Plasmids, Plasmids that, that mediate mating are found in several bacteria. bacteria. One, One example, example is, is the F plasmid. plasmid in Sorry about that. So for assessment question number 19, you're going to create a Venn diagram. Venn diagrams uh, allow you to compare and to contrast. So the first column, you are going to write down things that are found in F factor transfers only. In the last column, you'll write down things that are found in HFR transfer only. And then in the center column, you'll write things that are common to both. So my recommendation is to go back and take a look at these uh, steps that are involved. Put them side by side, write them out yourself and put them side by side and see what is the same. Is a pillus involved in both of them? Is the uh, plasmid integrated or is the plasmid extra chromosomal? Uh, what are some of the proteins that are being made? So you know about the relaxosome or do they both involve the relaxosome? Do they both have an origin of transfer? Uh, is there relaxase being involved? And don't forget in HFR that the entire um, F factor is incorporated into the host cell chromosome. So it can still make all of the same enzymes that it does in F factor transfer. In F factor transfer, the F factor is extra chromosomal. It is not integrated as an episome into the chromosome. So you are likely going to need more boxes in here. And when you type these answers in, then you can uh, just hit tab at the end right here. If you put your cursor right here at the end and hit tab, you will get another box added in there. So that completes uh, all of the slides for us, the assessment. There oh, I'm sorry, forgot that. Um, <laughs> I'm not there yet. Uh, I need to talk about transformation and then transduction. Uh, transformation uh, is what you're going to be seeing in your lab assignment. And this was first discovered by Frederick Griffiths in the late 1920s. This is a nonspecific acceptance of small fragments of DNA by a bacterial cell. So plasmids are small enough that plasmids can't enter a host cell through transformation. It's helped by a DNA binding pro uh, DNA protein binding on the cell wall. And uh, the cells that can do this are called competent. The example uh, that is given in your textbook, and it is a classic example of transformation, was first conducted by Griffiths and his colleagues, and he was studying Streptococcus pneumoniae. Streptococcus pneumoniae, as you already know, when it has, it has a capsule, it is virulent, and when it does not have a capsule, it is avirulent. So you can see that the Streptococcus pneumoniae here, it is actually a, dip, a diplococcus, and with this capsule around it, it is um, going to kill the mouse that it is injected to. The colony we call smooth because it has a, a capsule. And we saw Klebsiella pneumoniae in lab. Klebsiella pneumoniae is very snotty looking because it, ha it has a capsule. Uh, the same is going to happen with Streptococcus pneumoniae. When we grow it on media, it looks very slimy. So we call this the smooth strain. So what Griffiths did is he took this smooth strain and he heat killed it. And he, he knew that if he injected this uh, smooth strain into mice, the mice would die. Right? So then he took this smooth strain and he killed it by uh, heating it. And he injected that substance that he heated in here that had the dead uh, encapsulated S strain into the mice. And lo and behold, the mice survive. Okay? Now, he also took the rough colony. The rough colony did not have a capsule around it. Without the capsule, Streptococcus pneumoniae is not virulent. So he injected this live rough strain also into mice. Okay? The mice survived. So if you imagine this scenario right here and this scenario combining them, mice should live, right? So if you use heat, kill, heat killed smooth strain with living rough strain, if you mix those two together, both of them resulted in living mice, so they should also result in living mice. 
did not happen. When he mixed the two together, the mouse died. Rather confusing, so he took some of the blood from the mouse and looked at it, and what he recovered from the mouse blood was an encapsulated smooth strain of streptococcus pneumonia and non-encapsulated rough strain. So what was happening here? Well, these guys, the heat-killed S strain, they were dead. So what had happened was some of the DNA from this dead organism had entered through transformation into these living rough strains and had transformed them. In other words, the gene that came from the S strain coded for the capsule, and the capsule was synthesized then by the live rough strain. Hence, both of these samples were isolated from the dead mouse. This process then was called transformation and was elucidated by Griffiths. This is what we'll be doing in lab. Of course, we won't be doing anything with mice, but we're going to transform an E. coli that can't glow in the dark because it does not have the gene for green fluorescent protein into an E. coli with the gene for a green fluorescent protein and it will glow in the dark. Okay. So here you can see the gene for the capsule is present on this little piece of DNA. The double-stranded DNA fragment in blue here with a new gene in red binds to the surface receptor on a competent recipient cell. DNA then is going to be converted to one strand, transported into the cell by the DNA transport system, and then the DNA strand aligns itself with a compatible re region on the recipient's chromosome. The DNA strand is incorporated into the recipient chromosome, and now the recipient is transformed. It now has a gene for synthesizing a capsule, whereas before it, it could not synthesize a capsule. Okay. The last part of this uh, information for this assessment we want to look at is transduction. Transduction involves bacterial viruses as genetic ve vectors. So it's a good idea to pull up your knowledge about lysogeny and the lytic cycle in order to understand what's happening here. Remember that bacterial viruses are specific for their hosts. So when we have a colophage infecting a E. coli, it will only infect E. coli. It does not infect any other bacteria. There are two types of transduction we are going to look at here, generalized transduction and specialized transduction. This aligns with question number 20 on your assessment. And in this one, you also will be creating a Venn diagram. You're going to compare generalized and specialized transduction and add boxes if necessary. So again, what you only find in generalized transduction on the left, what you only find in specialized transduction on the right, and things that are common to both are going to go in the middle. So in generalized transduction, the bacteriophage, which is a virus, infects the host. And when it infects the host, it enters the lytic cycle. Okay. In the lytic cycle, now the host cell is going to be destroyed. The host cell DNA is going to be hydrolyzed by, by enzymes that are produced by the bacteriophage. And then new phage are going to assemble. As they assemble, occasionally a phage may accidentally incorporate a piece of host DNA. This phage is called a transducing phage and this phage has host DNA in it simply by accident. Any gene could be involved in this, any gene that is present in the host cell's chromosome. The new phage then lice the bacterial cell and escape. If the transducing phage has the, uh, finds another host and infects it, the transduced DNA then is recombined or swapped for the host cell gene, and this may change the genotype of the host cell. In generalized trans. Ah, sorry about that. Get rid of that one. Special. In generalized transduction, a segment of DNA is carried from one bacterial cell to another by a bacterial virus called a bacteriophage or phage.
The phage attaches to the bacterial cell and injects its nucleic acid into the host cell. A phage enzyme is produced that breaks down the host DNA into smaller fragments. Phage DNA is replicated and phage coat proteins are produced. During formation of the mature phage particles, a few phage heads may surround fragments of bacterial DNA instead of phage DNA. The phage particle carrying the bacterial DNA infects another cell, transferring the bacterial DNA to the new cell. When the bacterial DNA is introduced into the new host cell, it can become integrated into the bacterial chromosome, thereby transferring genes to the recipient. This cell then multiplies and carries new genetic material. Excuse me. The other type of transduction is called specialized transduction. In specialized transduction, a bacterial cell is infected by a phage, but this phage enters the lysogenic state. So remember, this is when the bacteria, um, the virus, integrates into the bacterial chromosome. The integrated phage is called a prophage or a temperate phage. Two words mean the same thing. The phage integrates into a site called the attachment site, which is identical in sequence to the bacterial cell. The phage produces integrase, an enzyme, which ligates the host DNA and swaps in. So ligating means it cuts out that DNA and it swaps in the phage DNA. The host bacterial cell may remain latent in the lysogenic state for many generations, meaning that the cell, uh, the bacterial cell is going to reproduce and in it, the, um, the phage DNA is going to reproduce. So it's a lot like with HIV. HIV integrates into the host cell as provirus, and every time the cell replicates, the, the viral DNA also replicates. So here, every time the bacterial DNA replicates, the viral DNA replicates. Certain conditions, such as exposure to UV light, may stimulate excision of the prophage, thus reactivating the virus, returning it to the lytic stage. So remember when we looked at lysogeny versus the lytic state? Here we have lysogeny, and now uh, the lytic state is induced. Usually this results in the entire phage genome packed into the viral head. So when uh, the lytic state ensues, we get complete new virus, and the virus is uh, only having viral DNA inside of the viral head. But sometimes the phage DNA is excised in such a way that an adjacent piece of bacterial DNA, such as a gene, is included in the phage head, and some of the phage DNA is missing. This, def this phage is now defective but it can still transduce the gene to other bacterial cells. So now when it, this defective phage leaves the host bacterial cell, it goes on to infect another bacterial cell, and this recipient cell then is going to get the DNA from the phage. It can either incorporate the donor DNA, that's bacterial DNA, and the phage DNA into the chromosome, or it can incorporate the donor DNA into the chromosome while the phage DNA remains extra chromosomal. So there are two possible outcomes here, incorporation of both the phage DNA and the bacterial DNA from the, from the donor, or you can have the phage DNA remains extra chromosomal and the DNA from the bacterial donor integrates into the bacterial recipient. Specialized transduction involves the transfer of only a few specific genes from one bacterial cell to another by means of a phage. The lambda phage, which infects E. coli, is a well-studied example of a specialized transducing phage. When lambda phage infects E. coli, the phage DNA enters the cell and then integrates into a specific site on the host chromosome. When, when an E. coli, e. coli culture, culture carrying the lambda, lambda phage is induced, phage, phage particles are produced. Are produced. On, On rare occasions, a piece of bacterial, bacterial DNA, for example, the gal gene, 
near the specific site of insertion remains attached to the phage DNA and a piece of phage DNA is left behind. The phage that develop are defective because they do not carry the entire phage genome but can still infect other cells. The defective phage can attach to another bacterial cell and the DNA can be injected. Both phage and bacterial DNA now become integrated into the new host chromosome. Only bacterial genes located near the site of integration of the phage DNA can be transduced, hence the term specialized transduction. Great. So that takes us to the end of the questions. That's uh, question number 20 for transduction. You'll be comparing specialized transduction and um, generalized transduction in a Venn diagram. Remember, all of these videos can be seen uh, through links that are found on Blackboard. You don't have to watch the slides again, but I would recommend watching the slides several times so that you're able to answer the questions.